funding for Portrait is provided in part by the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores. He has described himself as rather shy, yet he is internationally acclaimed as one of the most dynamic Shakespearean actors of our time. He is an outspoken advocate for gay rights in his native England and abroad. Our guest is Sir Ian McKellen. In the next half hour, he'll talk about the actor's craft, about a lesson learned from Sir Tyrone Guthrie, and about the most worthwhile role of his life. And has this life in the theater been what you imagined it would be? What you wanted it to be? Um, yes, it has. I mean, I'm now, uh, I've now been knighted, you know, and, and not many English actors uh, are given that award. So I suppose that there is, um, that compliment has been paid me and, and I'm now uh, officially, and entitled at least, in, in the company of people who I've spent my life admiring on stage, like Olivia and Gilgood and Richardson and so on. Uh, but between that point and, and the 30 years before when I started acting, uh, yes, I think the theatre has been always very welcoming to me. Uh, it's provided a variety of work. Perhaps I mightn't have expected that. Always a community, wherever it's happened. Always a sense of family. Uh, always a sense of, as when you walk through the stage door, of coming home, of being in a congenial place. It doesn't matter whether it's dirty whether, or, or clean, old or new, um, large or small. Just a place where people want to be and work well together. Did you grow up on a steady diet of theater as a child? I was uh, born and bred in the north of England uh, in the 1940s <clears throat> and early 50s. Uh, and before I left to go to Cambridge University to read English, I'd done an awful lot of theater going locally in, in Wigan and Bolton, uh, where there were a variety of theatres, um, repertory theatres, which did a different play every week. Um, visiting companies would come into the other theatres with uh, rather bad ballet and opera and musicals and pantomime, English pantomime. Uh, and then there was a variety theatre as well, which did vaudeville. Uh, then I used to go to Manchester, the big city, and see touring companies that were on their way in and out of London. And then in the summer, with the school camp, I would go to Stratford-upon-Avon and see the Shakespeare Festival there. So, yes, I did a great deal of theatre. And were you going. smitten? Smitten? Well, I, I was intrigued. Um, my parents took me initially, and um, then I used to go on my own. And uh, I, I never got into the habit of going to the movies. Uh, and then I used to act myself at school. And, uh, but that was very secondary to the business of theatre going, which is what I really enjoyed. And um, it was my hobby, and um, latterly has become my career. But I think probably actors are divided neatly between those who have so much energy to be exhibitionists that they simply have to get up on a platform and, and use that excess need for attention to uh, work it out in plays, and the rest of us who are rather tentative about life and, uh, and nervous and shy and, and only find that it's in the comfort of a, um, a life which has been plotted and planned and rehearsed and, and written, uh, that uh, we can feel absolutely free to abandon ourselves and, and declare ourselves and, and show a little bit of ourselves that uh, we don't in everyday life. So is theatre always totally safe territory? Uh, well, it is now. I, I, think, I think when I began acting 30 years ago, uh, I set myself the... Um, uh, the job of making myself more self-confident as an actor. The spin-off of that was that I became more self-confident as a person, but um, uh, outside the theatre. But you can't, I think, be a successful actor, certainly in the sort of plays I enjoy most being in, you know, the, the, the great plays which make enormous emotional and uh, mental and physical demands on you. You, you, you can't really discover what... Uh, you, you can't really contribute fully to them unless you, you are very, very, very open and are willing to explore 
yourself and, and cut yourself open and and, and um, risk making a fool of yourself, not in front of the audience, but uh, certainly in front of your peers and your friends in the rehearsal room. Uh, a lesson which uh, I c was taught to me very forcibly by Tyrone Guthrie, uh, a name I'm very happy to mention, uh, being in St. Paul and near his theatre in Minneapolis uh, in, the, in 1963. He came back to England to open a theatre in the Midlands called uh, the Nottingham Playhouse and with John Neville, the man who's now become a Canadian citizen and works so well there as an actor and director. Um, I was in uh, Cariah Lanus and, and played Telos of Phidias with Neville in the main part. And uh, Guthrie, I remember f f flapping down the, <laughs> the length of the stalls in this new theatre, still smelling of sawdust and dust from the newly laid carpet and saying, Ian, if you're not totally going to commit yourself to this, moment, the moment being, uh, just after I'd killed um, the great hero, Coriolanus, and immediately uh, regretted that I'd done it. Um, and Guthrie wanted me to keen and wail over the dead body of my greatest enemy and greatest friend. Uh, and he said, if you're not going to persuade the audience that these uh, people up on stage are greater than life itself and more important, they might as well all have stayed at home and watched television, and it's your duty to totally commit yourself to it. Words to that effect. And uh, words that I've not ever forgotten, that um, you have to learn how to be that daring, and, and that's what I was doing, I think, during the first ten years of my life as an actor. Do you think you've learned that, so that now you are at ease with the task when you're out in front of an audience? Or are there still moments of terror for you? Well, there's never been moments of terror for me actually on the stage. The, the, the terror, the embarrassment, the, the, the nervousness, the tentativeness was always in rehearsal. Um, um, no, I think since that little lesson, huge lesson that Guthrie taught me, I've, I've, I've not been frightened of doing anything on stage, whether it's taking my clothes off or jumping from a great height or um, dancing or singing or making a fool of myself, all the sort of things that I wouldn't uh, choose to do. How do you account for that? Um, it's a sort of pride in the job and doing it well and, and a sense as a theatre girl, which I still am, uh, that the performances that I most relish and the productions I most relish are ones in which uh, there is an obvious total commitment to the heights and depths of the material. And if you're not going to do that, well, you might as well do a, a job which pays better, has regular hours uh, and uh, doesn't cost uh, uh, as many, uh, as much effort and as much uh, risk taking. What about the relationship between you and many of the kinds of characters you've played that audiences know you for? Men of power in the classics, Shakespeare's men, dark men, evil men often, Iago, Macbeth, most recently, Richard mm. III. Mm. I, I don't think it's my obsession with, with the dark side of life. I think it's rather Shakespeare's. I mean, he, he wrote the great parts, and often the great parts are people who are dabbling in a side of life that most of us uh, either choose not to have anything to do with or, or are, are, are frightened of or, or have no ambitions toward. You know, men of, who are often soldiers, often fighting men, dab, uh, people for whom blood and is a part of their everyday life. People who are extremely ambitious for, for power, uh, they don't always know what they want to do with it. Uh, but people who really want to live life to the very edge. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare revolves his plots around such men very often. Uh, and they're the best parts, and it's, it's that I'm after the best parts rather than after uh, discovering what it's like to feel that I could be a murderer, or a mass murderer, or a tyrant. Macbeth was, 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 a, was another milestone for me, working for the first time professionally with Trevor Nunn at Stratford. We did Macbeth in a very small theatre, and uh, it's been recorded on video, and I think is the best ever uh, version of a Shakespeare on screen. And it, it captures the... Uh, the stultifying and oppressive atmosphere and the claustrophobia of the production. 
which lasted for two hours with no intermission. And uh, I remember a priest used to come and sit on the front row uh, uh, very often, and I asked him after the performance how he managed to get tickets, because they were very difficult to come by. He said, he said, I will steal to get tickets, because I come in and hold out my crucifix to protect the cast from the evil that you're uh, raising in this little tin hut in Stratford where we did the play. Uh, but why, why was that such a success? It wasn't just for my efforts, and it, it's, it's wrong to, for, for me to give the impression that it's alone in the theatre that you discover how to do it. You don't. You discover how to do it with other people. And uh, Dame Judy Dench was Lady Macbeth, and Roger Rees, who was known here for Nicholas Nickleby and Cheers, was playing Malcolm. It was a very, very strong cast indeed of just 12 actors who were all friends and who all worked very well together a brilliant director and designer. Uh, the production, I think, cost uh, $400 to put on. It was made out of um, beer crates and, uh, you know, old costumes. Uh, so it's nothing to do with what we sometimes think of as being important in the theatre. And there was no glamour and there was no excess. It was just a community of people landing at the right time, on the right material, in the right place, and it all coming together. You talk about the theatre as a family, so in, what, has it been your family? Has it been all-encompassing? Or is there a life outside the theatre for you? Oh, yes, of course there's a life outside it, but uh, it's... Um, I don't think there are many jobs that people go to uh, with that sense of, um, how can I put it, better than coming home, knowing... Of course, the, the, the personnel change each time you, you, you move from a company to a company or, or, or do another play. It's another group of people, but you've probably met some of them before. You've probably worked with some of them before. You probably know some of them by reputation. And then there will be some new people. The beauty of the theatre is that, uh, as in this company at the moment, I'm working with a 74-year-old man and a 10-year-old boy in the same company, and we're equals. We go around together during the day. We, we, we're interested in each other's work. Uh, uh, the connections that are made uh, across the generations and across the sexes and across sexuality and across politics in the theatre is miraculous. We're, we're, we're all likely to be highly developed um, oddities, uh, well, individuals, and yet we come together to work on the text of a play, the playwright being at the centre of our attention for a group of strangers, the audience, who we try to bring into our family circle. It's a wonderful word for uh, the theatre, isn't it? The house. We call it the house. And a house is a place for uh, people to communicate on that level, which is the way human beings are meant to um, communicate, without the aid of technology, without the aid of the fax machine or the television or the telephone without the aid, I always insist, uh, of the microphone in the theatre, so that um, what starts in my, the centre of my being and my diaphragm vibrating, pushing the air over my, from my lungs up through, over my vocal cords, through the complications of my mouth, from my very lips, travel across the air, and these waves can be measured and hit your eardrum, so we are intimately connected. Uh, and travelling along those uh, airwaves are emotions and thoughts, uh, and uh, it's human beings confronting each other and meeting each other and resolving something together and leaving the building at the end of a performance feeling something happened, and it happened to us all. Uh, and tomorrow night it will happen again, but it won't be the same, because it'll be another group of people. And. Uh, the specialness of that, the fact that it can't be recreated, it can't be mass-produced, it's, it's alien to everything that uh, the world is tending towards. Um, just confirms to me that the theatre is a good place to be, it's an honest place to be, and if we're talking about family values, which we do in this uh, day and age, uh, it's, it's they're, they're the values that I re really care about, which is direct communication between people and honesty, and the theatre is dealing in those matters. And it's a privilege to be involved. Speaking of direct communication and honesty, let's talk about your coming out, which happened a few months before you received knighthood. Can you set the scene of uh, what happened? That was in January of 1988. Of how it happened and when and where? 
Um, I'm sometimes asked, uh, when did I first know I was gay? And I, I say to the person who asked the question, well, the, the first time that you knew that you were gay or, or that you knew you were straight. Um, my sexuality has been fixed um, pretty well for, from as long as I've been aware that I was a sexual being. Uh, and yet, so that would be, what, um, 10, 11, 12, the time I started being showing any interest in life at all, going to the theatre. Uh, but it took me till I was 49 to actually complete the process of, of, of coming out, um, the completion being that I didn't mind anyone in the world knowing that I was gay. Some people of my generation are less happy than I and, and haven't uh, completed the process and may never. Uh, and it was pushed, I was pushed towards it uh, in this country, uh, in San Francisco, when I, I met Armistead Maupin, the author of Tales of the City, and his lover, Terry Anderson. And uh, talking about coming out in general, uh, rapidly being them, my being in their house came down to the particular because they're great proselytizers and think uh, there's nothing more important for the individual lesbian or gay man to uh, come out, uh, and nothing better for the society at large than that they should do that. And I agreed with them in principle, but put forward the argument that would anyone take me seriously as a, as a, in straight parts if they knew that I was gay? Was that your main fear? I don't really know. I, probably not. Now, the main fear is that uh, is a, a result of the intense pressure that is put on any homosexual in, in practically any society in the world, except maybe San Francisco, to conform to... Uh, and if you're not going to conform, to pretend that you're conforming and to lie about yourself and to keep hidden and to shut up and to not frighten the horses and, and, and to be dishonest. And, and when the pressures have been on you to do that for 49 years, it takes more than just one conversation to argue you round from that. Uh, and, but those conversations took place, and, and shortly after, as I, I was back in England, where the Thatcher government was introducing a, a nasty, short and brutish law which would have um, inhibited um, local authorities in, in the United Kingdom from spending very minimal sums on providing social services for lesbians and gays, which are, which are needed in specific cases. And, and in, in, in professing my um, anger about that and my total opposition to it, uh, I felt it was only proper to say that I was gay. And in an interview like this on, 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 on British radio, um, I, uh, I, I've casually and uh, resoundingly, uh, the best thing I ever did in my life, said that I was gay. I'm thinking of uh, something I read about which you were receiving an award for your AIDS activism and you were in, in California in front of a star-studded audience and you said to them, if there's anybody here that wants to make that decision and mm. needs some help, myself and my friends will meet you in the corner in the lobby. Yes, well, I, I have sometimes thought that, that someone should arrive, like, like a latter-day Billy Graham, and go around uh, the world having revival meetings and, and, and encouraging gays and lesbians to come forward to, to the front of the stage and, and not saving themselves, being saved for Christ, but coming out. Uh, and what they would meet at the front of the stage w would, would be counsellors and people who would help them in their particular uh, situation. Everyone's dilemma is different, uh, and um, anyone coming out needs to be surrounded with friends who understand uh, the situation, and, and uh, because they may well, well, at whatever age you do it, you may discover that you alienate your family who think somehow they've let you down by, the, by your being gay, who, who, who probably never discussed the, the topic and certainly not thought about it in direct relationship to a member. Uh, of their immediate circle. So there are many, many complications, but I, I just give them my own witness and, and the witness of everybody else I know who is out, that their life has been hugely improved and immediately. Uh, and the relief and the release of not lying anymore, uh, of being honest, uh, has all sorts of spin-offs, as it's had for me, uh, I think, in my acting, in my relationships with other people. Uh, What's and changed? In my self-awareness of, of well, I, there's, there's no, I have nothing to hide anymore. I can be absolutely honest. Are you a better actor because of it? Yes, that? I think probably I am. I'm uh, because I'm more in touch with my emotions than I used to be. And there's nothing being banked down anymore. There's an awful lot of old coke and cinders and 
stuff, an old phlegm that's coming out of my, uh, out of me, literally and 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 uh, metaphorically, and it's um, um, it's a great, great release, and it cannot be recommended too highly. But with that, for many people, and not for me, because I live a charmed life in the metropolitan area. Uh, in the theatre, where on the whole people have no problems with with a variety of sexuality, uh, I'm very I'm a successful actor. You know that my career hasn't stopped, uh, and perhaps maybe has even been enhanced by it. Uh, but that is not true for most people uh, in the theatre, outside the theatre. Many people in this country and in mine, if they were to declare they were gay, would lose their jobs, as Commander Margareta Kalamaya recently did. Uh, after her all that length of service in the American Armed Forces, as you would in my country if you were a school teacher. I think, I think people just don't realize that the, the depth and, and the power of, of the anti-gay propaganda, which is just, and the pro-heterosexual propaganda, which is just at the basis of society, uh, you know, the wedding ring, the photograph album of of the wedding, the the perpetual the, the photographs of the children, which straight people declare their sexuality, the, the advertisement in the newspaper to announce the wedding. Uh, none of these are options for for lesbians and gays. Uh, our relationships, um, if declared, get us into all sorts of problems with the law. Uh, and with housing and with education uh, and with uh, adoption or fostering of children. Uh, and then when you get very senior politicians, in my country, I'm afraid, as well as yours, uh, declaring that somehow anyone who uh, is gay or lesbian uh, is outside the mainstream uh, and either must be converted or cast aside from society. Uh, because they are, in some sense, trying to corrupt it. Uh, no wonder uh, gays and lesbians so often uh, decide that they will lie about themselves. And that's what they're being encouraged to do by, by, by uh, very cruel politicians who are very unmindful of their constituents. So how has your life changed since coming out? Well, um, I think the most astonishing change was, uh, if we're talking about emotional awareness and what happened inside, which I know is what you, you're really interested in, um, was to realize that actually there was nothing more important to me than, than um, reconciling the uh, society at large to the minority of uh, homosexuals in their midst, most of them hidden many of them unhappy, all of them oppressed by the majority. Uh, and the best way I could do that was by talking about it and writing about it and, and, and putting my influence wherever I could amongst politicians and the media. And that that activity, or the aim of that activity, which was to make the world a better place, and not just for the minority, but for the majority who would get to know the real worth of the minority, that was more worthwhile, more satisfying, gave me more pleasure, gave my life more meaning than anything I'd ever done so far, including acting and the theatre. When you think of uh, the next decade of your life, or even on after that, what kind of person do you want to become as you keep growing, as you reap the benefits of having come out? I don't I have any sense of the person I might become. I, 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 I can tell you the sort of people I want to be with, and uh, I, I would like to always be in touch with young people, uh, such as stimulus and, and um, reminder that um, uh, age and experience doesn't bring wisdom, necessarily. Um, I'd always like to be in contact with people older than myself, uh, which I've, the com their company I've really enjoyed. I'd want to be in the company of people who enjoyed laughing, who enjoyed talking and arguing and, and, and uh, worrying about how the world could be a better place. Uh, and I want to go on acting. And uh, I'm the sort of 
I want to be the sort of person who would enjoy being in that situation, and I suppose pretty well that means carrying on as I've done before, aware, of course, that I'm changing all the time, and it's with some mystery that I look at old photographs and think, golly, was that me? Did I take advantage of how good-looking I was, or whatever it is that you look back on? And um, so I don't want to stay fixed, uh, and I always want to be stimulated to discover that there's more in life that one can uh, contribute to and, uh, and find out about. Sir Ian McKellen, thank you for being with us on Portrait. Thank you. Funding for Portrait is provided in part by the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores. This program was produced by KTCA, a Minnesota original.